with me today on this panel that, that I'm going to try to facilitate a discussion. Uh, we've got three uh, individuals, a uh, couple of whom you probably know. Uh, first of all, Representative Mays Middleton. Uh, Representative Middleton uh, actually served on the board of, of TPPF uh, until he went and got himself elected to the legislature <laughs> and couldn't do that anymore. So, so he was elected to the Texas House in 2018, represents District 23, encompassing Chambers County and part of Galveston County. He's appointed to the House Committee on Urban Affairs, Elections, and Local and Consent Calendars, as well as the Policy Committee of the Texas House Republican Caucus. He's the president of Middleton Oil Company, which is an independent oil and gas company. I understand we may have a few of these in Texas, and also runs uh, his cattle uh, ranching and farming operations. Um, you got any, any mud there? On that? Okay, no, you're, I just want to make sure right that you're, you're these not. Chambers County alligators. Okay, yeah. well, they were. Were. Yeah, that's good. It's good. We don't want more of those things roaming around your county there. Uh, especially because they might compete with politicians. So um, to, to, to uh, Representative Middleton's right, we have Senator Bob Hall. Uh, he's been in the Texas Senate, uh, appointed chairman of the Committee on Agriculture, vice chairman of the Committee on Veterans Affairs and Border Security. Uh, Veterans Affairs, because he's a veteran, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we actually did something similar in our, in our prior life uh, in the aerospace industry. We, we both uh, did the same sort of job, uh, which is kind of fun because not a lot of people know about it. You, you might want to ask them about it later. It's kind of a, kind of a hard thing to understand, but it, it's difficult work. Um, he graduated from the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina with a degree in electrical engineering, so he, he might maybe a little uh, logic oriented there. Received a regular commission, and I'll have to forgive him for this, as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force. I don't know. It's a, have we ever won a war since the Air Force split off from the Army? <laughs> you know, I don't know. So, uh, so. We haven't lost one. <laughs> we haven't lost one. Okay, there you go. All right, all right, very touche. So upon graduation, he became, uh, went on active duty as a systems engineer working to, uh, to develop the Minuteman missile system during the Cold War at Norton Air Force Base in California, which wasn't far from where I used to represent in the California legislature, achieved the rank of captain before leaving the service and then uh, going to work uh, in an engineering consulting company. And lastly, we have Tom Forbes. Uh, Tom Forbes, I'm very grateful that, that Tom has shown up today uh, to participate in this panel because uh, at TPPF, we want a discussion of an issue with, with a full spectrum of ideas, right? What, what we're trying to do at policy orientation is we're not trying to present one side only. We want a discussion. And Tom brings us that discussion. He has over 35 years experience representing clients in their dealings with the state and federal government, agencies, legislators, members of Congress, and the executive branch. And of course, as government has gotten larger and more complex and more difficult to manage, people that do what Tom does are indispensable for our current, uh, uh, just being able to operate business and not end up you know, being fined or, or sent to prison or something. Uh, you gotta know what to do to stay out of trouble and to how to, how to make a profit, how to, how to conduct business. He's a member of Butler Snow's Business Development and Practices in the Regulatory and Government Group. Uh, his practice is concentrated on government relations, regulatory and public affairs advice and advocacy and business transaction. And he serves as the director and chair of the Audit Committee of the Austin Trust Company. So ladies and gentlemen, please give our panel a warm welcome. Yeah, I'm not seeing a mic on the, phone, on, the, uh, on the chair there, so I'm gonna go back over here. Thought I was gonna manage this thing from over there, so we'll, we'll just stay up here, uh, a little more formal. I'll have to make sure that you all don't get into a scrape because I can't break it up from over here, so, so be nice to each other. So, so tell me, uh, first question will be to, to you, Tom. Um, there's an issue when it comes to lobbying, whether it's by corporations or by wealthy individuals or by labor unions, and you would probably argue, you know, local government. There's an issue about advocacy and free speech. Could you let us know your view of why it's so important that cities and counties and special districts and school districts in Texas have the basically the right to petition redress of grievances to their 
to the legislature. Well, I think all citizens should have the right to come see these gentlemen and, and their colleagues in the legislature. Um, and I don't think that I, that I, I, and I and our association, the Professional Advocacy Association of Texas, uh, differs very much from what Representative Middleton and Senator Hall's uh, goal is uh, with the, some of the legislation that, that, that they've introduced uh, about taxpayer-funded lobbying. Because everybody, every, all of you are lobbyists, uh, and I, I am. Uh, the, the only thing, the only difference is, is whether or not you have to register. And so, uh, and we have a very strong lobby law in Texas uh, that requires, and, and we stand and we believe in full disclosure and complying with the law, and, uh, and, it, and the public needs to ha be able to know who is coming to meet with members of the legislature and uh, the administrative agencies and decision makers. And, ha and by using our lobby law, which is, as I say, quite a strong one, so that the people that are doing this you have to register, you have to tell, tell the Ethics Commission what you're lobbying about, you have to tell, give some indication of how much you're spending, and that's good for the public, and that's good for our, for our government. So, um, and it furthers the, the, the citizens' right to petition their government, and so that's, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but that's. I, I think it gets the ball rolling. So, Senator Hall, um, there was some landmark legislation that passed out of the, both the House and the Senate, and I'm thinking of Senate Bill 2 and House Bill 3, which in time will serve to reduce the rate of increase on the property taxes of everyone in this room. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me about the discussions to the degree that you're allowed to discuss perhaps things that were talked about within the Republican caucus and the Senate my understanding was that Senator Betancourt was concerned about the the individuals who went and testified against SB2. Could, is, is that something that that you want to give some observations about? Sure. Absolutely, but uh, before I get to that, I'd like to comment on one thing. Sure, of I'll course. Do what Tom had to say. And what we were trying to do here is not an anti-lobbying bill. The lobbying has been part of our government. Uh, it was It was picked up as part of the Judeo-Christian Judeo values and principles of liberty that our founding fathers, but they reached all the way back to lobbying has been, been as a part of government since the Magna Carta in 1215. It was part of the deal that they cut so the citizens could petition the king. It was picked up in the English Bill of Rights in 1689 as a specific item. And in essence, it's embodied in our constitution with the right to petition the government. Right. But all of that is aimed towards individuals, not government. So are you the saying rights. that people have rights, the but government doesn't have rights? People have rights. The government has... Power. Power, absolutely. Right. So, but now to answer your question, yes, we were concerned about the lobby and what was said in that bill and numerous other bills that, that the... Uh, lobby that was representing cities, counties, municipalities, and school districts would come and lobby against bills that we were trying to pass to protect individual liberties, limit taxation, right. protect the free markets, and things of that nature, and they would do so, not very politically right, in what I would consider less than an honorable way, in that they would actually lie about what was being proposed or what was being said or encourage people to come lobby uh, and give them bad information, false information. Right. And we've seen that time after time. Um, it was uh, in, in the particular bill you were talking about, uh, they were going to tell the folks, let's see if I, I had a quote from that was put out by uh, TML. And if I can well, read. while you're looking for that, yeah. I was told so, by Senator Betancourt that there were 29 people that testified against SB2, which was the Senate uh, property tax relief uh, bill. And of those 29 people, uh, every single one of them yep. was either an elected official at local government, a, a, an appointed staff member of local government, 
or a uh, paid lobbyist of local government. There wasn't one average citizen that went and said, hey, please, I'm an average Texan and I, I don't work for city government and I really want my property taxes to continue to go up at the rate they've been going. It's kind of shocking. You'd think with a, a state of 28 million people, there'd be at least one person who'd show up that says, I love property taxes, man. Have you found it, that quote? It, yeah, I've got the quote here. But in what you just described, this the bill we had would not have stopped those elected officials. They right. have every right, right to right. come and, and testify as an individual. It were those that were being paid with taxpayer money to sure. come and argue against the taxpayer. And here's, here's what TML was telling them. It said, all of our testimony should be focused on the negative consequences of revenue caps. There were no caps. That's right. a lie. On our citizens without producing any tax relief. That's not true. I mean, it wasn't great, but there was tax relief. So that was another lie. The revenue cap will seriously damage public safety. That's a lie. Economic development and transportation. Those are lies. And property taxes will continue to become, will continue to rise because school district taxes, which are the largest that there are, that's that's an that's accurate. The school taxes are actually higher. Will continue to escalate, and then to try to get to the uh, elected officials. The bottom line of our message is that legislators will get no credit for reducing taxes and all the blame for everything citizens can't afford to do. And so that was the message they put out sure. for these folks to come and testify. And, oh. and that's you know, yeah. grossly inaccurate. And the things they came down and testified against, the list, and I put together a partial list here, uh, Starting with what you had, property tax reform, sanctuary cities. Wait, wait, they, wait, wait a minute. They used taxpayer dollars to argue what now? Against the passage of sanctuary cities. So in, in, any limitation on, on sanctuaries? Yeah. Okay, wow. And this, okay. Um, the it, you know, uh, property rights, individual liberty bill of the tree ordinance uh, ban, okay. paid sick leave ordinance ban restricting businesses, they argued against that. The fracking uh, bill that we passed right. argued against that. Red light cameras, and I think the citizens were really happy that we got rid of red light cameras, but we had the lobbyists in there huh? using taxpayer dollars to argue against it. The Chick-fil-A bill, the ban on abortion provider contracts, taxpayer protection and transparency, which is what we're talking about, annexation, uh, education savings accounts, the cable franchises, short-term rentals, building materials deregulation, business preemption, oh. against state income tax, which was overwhelmingly approved by the people on the ballot. They came in uh, and against argued the bill against, that would, against would the limit, bill yeah, that right. would have limited. Okay. Uh, they were tax, uh, actually came in and testified against some of the bills to try to reduce election fraud. And they have te testified against every bill that's done anything to try to rein in the toll roads in Texas, to back on, to, on uh, managed lanes. They have testified against them using taxpayer dollars to do it. So, Representative Middleton, how did you get interested in this issue? In other words, did, was this something that was on your radar screen before? Did someone come to you? How, 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 did, how did you learn about this? You know, it, it, it got on my radar screen, me seeing all kinds of conservative legislation dying, right? And, you know, then I start to look into it and, well, why, why is that happening? And you look at the, the lobby registration list, you look at the witness list, and you see that our own money is being spent to hire lobbyists to hurt us, the taxpayer. This is, a, this is more than just one bill. It's more than just a bad a moral policy that we're trying to end. It, it, it is the blocker to a lot of conservative pro-taxpayer legislation. I think, frankly, Texans are offended that their money is going to the pockets of Austin lobbyists who are advocating against their best interest. 91% are against it. And you see that. It's being diverted away from filling potholes. It's being diverted away from teachers. It's being diverted away from police, diverted away from fire. And it's going to Congress Avenue, Austin lobbyists who are there in the Capitol every day 
doing things like, you know what, Texas should become like California was one of their positions. We should, we should kill the ban on a state income tax and become like California and pass a state income tax. I mean, that is a position that 75% of Texans are against. So this is wrong that our money is being diverted to their pockets to hurt us, the taxpayer. So couldn't you argue though, I mean, uh, the, the, going to Tom and all, all, all three of you, couldn't you argue though that, that in a representative democracy, right, you have different groupings of people, different interests, and that perhaps, perhaps the interests of the urban core of, of Houston or Austin and the people who live there and their city councils are different than perhaps the people of your district, what, to the east of the Dallas Metroplex, isn't that wh wh where you represent? So, or down in Galveston, right? So, so what, what's wrong with, you know, the, having the voice, if you will, of, of Houston represented more robustly in the state legislature? It, to, to Tom first, perhaps, and then, I don't, I don't think that anything's wrong with it, uh, but I would really think that the core issue is, is the fact that by banning, if you just, if the legislature enacts a ban on taxpayer, let's, the, the term taxpayer funded lobbying, it doesn't mean that those entities, the, the hospital district, the community college district, the fire, fire control district, or the city, or the county, it doesn't mean that they're not gonna lobby. It just means they're not gonna register. And you, the public, won't know what they're doing. You won't know what they're lobbying about. You won't know how much is being spent on it. And, no, and there won't be any reporting done. So that what, we, what I'm here to say is that a robust uh, system of having to tell the public what you're doing is a better safeguard uh, than a ban that won't work. Because it, you gentlemen will still be visited by people uh, uh, advocating uh, on what they perceive to be, you know, the right side of it uh, for, for these entities. It's just that they won't have to re register. So we think that registering and complying with the law and tra having a transparent system is, is, gives, is good for the public and, and it is, makes the, uh, these entities much more transparent. Well, actually, I, would, I, I do have a point on that. Um, we did pass a bill this session, House Bill 1495 and Senate Bill 65. So, it, you know, forever the taxpayer funded lobbyists always killed the disclosure bill. They want to continue to hide from us how much of our money is going to them. So we said enough. We're actually going to broaden it beyond that and say not just registered lobbyists, but local government must line item in their budget from now on how much they're spending to advocate for directly or indirectly any legislation, so we will know that now. We did not know that before, and it did not have to be line item. So that has changed, and actually I sent out a letter to 3,000 cities, county, counties, and school districts, and they're very angry to get a letter saying, please disclose, please follow the law. And I'm a little confused why so many would be upset simply at a request of a letter to follow the law and tell us how our tax money is being spent. And they felt like, oh, we're being attacked. How is it an attack to tell us how our money's being spent? You know, so this, this is a simple change, but it was profoundly opposed in our legislature. And that speaks to the immoral nature of this practice. And they're not advocating for the best interests. Like we, there was a lobby firm this, this session, Hillco. Uh, they got fired by the city of Houston because it turns out they were hired by the city of Houston to oppose a cable fee uh, cut bill. That was Dade Phelan's bill. Turns out they were on the other side of it and they worked for an association to try to pass the same bill. That was discovered in the middle of session. So they, they, they were getting paid on both sides of the issue. They don't represent our communities. Sounds, sounds more like an issue of, of corporate governance than necessarily uh, something else. Let me go, go ahead and then I have another question for the two lawmakers. Is something that is wrong as using taxpayer money to lobby against the taxpayer just because it may be difficult to enforce it or difficult we may have to come up with something else is no reason for us not to try to stop it. To protect, because we have a responsibility to protect the people of Texas. And when their money is being misused, being used to actually work against them the way these bills were, and this isn't just a little thing here and there. This is huge in all of the bills that are out there that, that are protecting liberty, protecting the free enterprise system, that 
that we have a responsibility to protect right. the people. And so if we have to come back next session and find a way to word it differently, to bring more transparency to, to do it, then, then we just have, have to so, do that. So kind of building on that, but then asking the two lawmakers, isn't it the case though, going back to my question about you know, the city of Houston or the city of Austin, that in our system of government, you might argue that that community has, a, has voted for a different set of interests than is necessarily the majority currently in the House and the Senate of Texas. And I'm presuming that the two of you as lawmakers probably get phone calls from local uh, county commissioners and, and city council members and school board members uh, suggesting that you vote one way or the other. I mean, is that something that's fairly common? And, and that door is wide open to them. I had much rather, and I do spend time talking with our elected officials, I love to hear from them. I, I want to hear what they have to say, and actually my ears are a whole lot more open when I get a call from an elected official than I get from a lobbyist who's in there that, that is, and I know what they're saying is not in the best interest of the people. And the elected officials that come in to talk to us don't even lobby the same way the hired lobbyists do, right. and, and it's, and the hired lobbyist is really representing the elected officials, not the people whose money they're spending. Yeah, so, so Tom, I mean, one of the arguments I heard in favor of, of this was that you have, for example, rural jurisdictions in the panhandle or uh, part-time, just like we have a part-time, although certainly it doesn't seem like part-time. I know you guys put a lot of time into it, okay? So right. you're paid part-time, right. and the taxpayers appreciate we only pay you $7,200 a year, right. but we really know that it's close to a full-time job. Uh, in fact, it sounds like a minimum wage violation when you th sound a little bit, but I, I guess... I guess we'll, we'll talk about that later. So, so I, I've also heard, though, that it's the case that if you look at, for example, school board members, right, how, how can we expect a school board member to necessarily know about the intricacies of what a bill might do to school funding, and isn't that then a legitimate purpose for taxpayer-funded lobbyists because you know, there's a, like a knowledge gap as well as a time gap. In other words, they're not in the state capitol all the time. They're off, yeah. you know. So, well, that's so, a good point. Uh, you know, these public bodies, um, be they school boards, be they cities, be they counties, hospital districts, community colleges, et cetera, they, they have the authority and do and have to be able to hire their hire experts to they hire their accountants, you know, architects, engineers, actuaries, lawyers, uh, insurance consultants, and have access to, to, to expert help. Um, and so that ought to be available to, uh, to these, these public bodies as well. And as I've said uh, previously, it so long as the, the public is aware of what, is, what they're doing, what they're being paid to do, and how much they're being paid, and so long as then that's good for the, these bodies to get this expert help, it's good for the public to be able to, to be aware of it, and it's a much more transparent uh, way to operate. Let, let me ask for the two lawmakers, and maybe someone will want to take this first. Um, it was my experience in my time in the California legislature that, that lobbyists had a lot of clients, right? And that lobbyists often had the ability to suggest campaign contributions from the people they represented, right? Uh, as well, and I know the rules are different in, in, in California, the, the gift limitations are more stringent, right? So there weren't the, the you know, as many perhaps steak dinners but isn't it, is it the case that most of the lobbyists you interact with have the ability to put a fair amount of resources or to direct resources into campaigns and as well as potentially entertain lawmakers? Is that something that you see in your time in the legislature? Well, they, they do, but jumping back to the association, so uh, our bill, Senate Bill 29, House Bill 281, would have not prohibited any association from providing information or taking positions on bills, it just would have prevented them from hiring a lobbyist. So we, we had someone just the other day in elections committee uh, with the Texas Association of Elections Administrators, and he testified for dozens of bills all session, uh, many legislators' offices he went into. I can't tell you how many hours. He was not registered as a lobbyist. So this does not impact 
their voice in any way. We're just going after registered lobbyists. And frankly, um, some of the associations really have some serious conflicts of interest, like Texas Association of Counties is a single bid, no bid provider for insurance for a lot of counties. And guess what? TAC is not paying their Hurricane Harvey claims, like in Victoria County. You know, so they're really, in a lot of cases, associations are not representing the best interests of our communities. And you know, also, what's also not very well known is that TAC and TML, the association employees, are in our state pension system right now, which I think is fundamentally wrong. The taxpayers are having to subsidize a defined benefit plan for groups that lobby like that. So Senator Hall and, and, and Representative Middleton, have you ever, though, heard of or have personally experienced um, a, a, a lobbyist potentially insinuating that it would be good or bad for you electorally, that they could make your life more or less difficult? I was featured in a TML video, so TML's conference was this past fall, and I, you probably were too, as the bad guys. We're the bad guys, you know, and they did a, a grainy black and white video. I'm still trying to get my hands on it, but no one will seem to give it to me. Um, you know, that uh, we're the bad guys of the legislature, you know, so I guess if looking out for the taxpayer makes you a bad guy uh, around the Capitol, according to them, you know, so yeah, I've seen that, and and they, uh, there were also some training sessions on how to uh, advocate, uh, you know, for, for in elections, even though they can't spend taxpayer money. Uh, they had some training. Um, there's a taxpayer-funded lobbying association that, that pays uh, Dan Patrick's old opponent, Scott Milder, to train uh, uh, school board members and, and other public education employees on advocacy. Uh, well, you know, of course, they're going to advocate against bills like this, the ban on taxpayer-funded lobbying. Interesting. So what were some of the bills? You mentioned the two bills. What were the effects of any of the reforms that were passed into law this last session? Can, you, can either of you give us a little more detail about how the law has changed? Well, one of the big ones, do you want to? Go ahead. Was uh, Senate Bill 65 and uh, House Bill 1495. Those are the taxpayer-funded lobbying disclosure laws we passed this session. We, d we did not have that. Connie Burton filed that. I think you were a co-author on that in the 2017 session. Guess who opposed that? The taxpayer-funded lobbyists. So we were able to actually get that done after the ban failed on the House floor. And, and by the way, a little sidebar story on there. The gallery was lined with taxpayer-funded lobbyists the day that bill was up on the House floor, and they cheered the moment that it failed. And that was one of the most revolting sounds I've ever heard in our state legislature, because we're the ones that lost when that happened. But um, I sent a letter out to 3,000 cities, counties, and school districts just saying, hey, produce your contracts. A number of them have lied to me, and I've caught them lying, where they say, we don't have any contracts. Then I see, like, you know, Deer Park and LaPorte, I get a hold of their lobbying contract. They didn't tell me the truth. Uh, we see a lot of other things, like TML, they don't have contracts with cities. So our cities are paying dues to them, but they don't have a contract. I think that's fundamentally wrong. It's our tax money that's going to it. I've had a number of county officials say the consensus of 254 counties is that we continue to be able to have taxpayer-funded lobbyists. I don't agree. We got 91% of Texans that don't agree with that either. So, I mean, I think our position is very clear. More disclosure is good. Uh, we're going to hopefully come out with a lot more of that information as our office receives it. Uh, we're also going to have to be sending some more demand letters to those that are not complying because it's a legislative information request. It's not a public information request. And it's also unprecedented that the Senate State Affairs and the House State Affairs Committee have identical interim charges on this to study taxpayer-funded lobbying. And it says that they may not represent taxpayer interests. I agree. Uh, you're going to get a chance to vote those that are Republican. We're going to get a chance to vote on that uh, in the primary election because it's one of the ten propositions. They're on there with some other good propositions. Uh, so you'll get a chance, but I will tell you every town hall I've had, every meeting I've had, every discussion I've had with the citizens, it is overwhelmingly supported by the people that their tax dollars, they don't want their tax dollars, tax dollars going to spend time lobbying against, I mean, the Texas Ethics Committee showed there was $77 million spent with taxpayer money uh, in lobbying last year. And the city of Austin has six full-time lobbyists. 
on now, hold. Th th those individuals that work for the city, right? I'm, or are they are they contractors I'm, I'm, or do I'm they not, work for the city? I'm not sure where they are, but I mean they're not far from the capital. Right. They have a, and the county right. and the school district have similar uh, right. staff or or folks that they they hire to lobby. We're not that far away, and for those that are out in far west Texas or east Texas, there's some uh, new technology out that they can use to contact us, and it's called a phone, and I do get a, I mean, it's not difficult to, to get hold of us. I have put my cell phone on everything I've ever put out, including TV ads and radio ads. It's my personal cell phone number, so it's easy to talk. And, and I'd much rather hear from an elected official or a, a member of the government that's hired to do a job to come talk to me about something that would help them do their job better in serving the people. Not necessarily in like TML's presentation that they take around using taxpayer money is called shake the money tree. And that's where they try to teach a local elected officials how to get new revenue stream in their area so they can bleed the public of more tax money. And that's how your tax dollars are being used in addition to the, the lobbying side. So the, the two bills that you two gentlemen sponsored that, uh, that ultimately we had one bill that passed the Senate, right, and then uh, failed in the House. My understanding is I recall the, both the support and the opposition was bipartisan. So you had, you had people from both parties on either side of those measures. What were some of the things your colleagues told you, if they did, about their reluctance to support this reform legislation? Did you find a common theme? Was there something that the people in this audience might be able to help with uh, to, to encourage them to vote differently? What, what was it that your oh, colleagues it, told you? It, were, it was the misrepresentation of the bill. It was false statements about my local officials said, we pass this bill, they won't be able to come to Austin. Or if they come to Austin, they won't be able to recoup travel expenses. Uh, or they can't uh, get paid for the time that they're down here. Or we can't, but now, now they, I even had one tell me that uh, their local officials told them they would no longer even be able to talk to their legislator. And so the opposition was coming from what we've seen a number of other bills is just false representation of what the bill actually did in order to raise the level of ire of the people and want them to be, I mean, I said, you know, if our bill did what you said it was going to do, I wouldn't vote for it either. But it, it doesn't. It's not doing that. It does not prohibit, would not prohibit anybody from voicing their opinion as an individual. It was aimed strictly at not using taxpayer dollars, which is coming from a wide number of people, not many of which so would support how the money is being used. And that's where the big difference is, is where the money is being used to do something that does not have the support of the people who provided the money. That's the taxpayer. It, it encourages that direct representation like we do. So, you know, the state, uh, we don't advocate for sending lobbyists down to City Hall or Commissioner's Court. You know, we, we don't need to do that. Uh, we advocate directly. We communicate with our commissioners and our city council and our school, our school boards directly. They have our cell phones. That's the whole point of the system. That's what our founding fathers set up. We're supposed to represent our constituents and our taxpayers because the ultimate form of local control is the individual taxpayer and not some Congress Avenue law, lobbyist. That's not local control. And it's not, and it's not even, I mean, the, the lobby, I, the lobby in general provides a good service. We get a lot of information from associations that have lobby. Uh, I mean, organizations like Texas Right to Life, uh, NRA, and go down the list of, uh, of folks that advocate for the people that are supporting them because they choose to. Don't, nobody chooses to pay taxes, but they do choose to be members of organizations. And so it is different, but we, we get a good perspective on both sides of an issue from organizations, and that's appropriate. And, and I think it's an integral part of our government that makes it work, work better. I would never support anything that dampened the voice of the lobby, per se. So if you look at this issue, which is a relatively recent issue in the sense that you can go back a few years. There has been some discussion, but I don't think in modern Texas history we've seen as much attention 
given to this, Tom, you may disagree. Perhaps you have a different historical perspective. But, you know, the governor actually uh, talked about uh, this as something that he'd like to see done. Is there any, do, do, do the three of you see any grounds for compromise on, on this issue, given the increased swelling of support for it? Or, or is this just a case where it's binary? Either we do it or we don't. Well, I, I, for, for me and for the people I, I represent, uh, uh, when I say the people I represent, I'm the president of the Professional Advocacy Association. It's the professional organization of the government affairs community in Texas. And by the way, very briefly, I jokingly refer to that, you'll have to excuse me, as the lobbyist for the lobbyists. Yeah. Okay, just to be right. very, it's, it's, I, it's too many I can't help. help it, I can't you, help it. Because you just I couldn't help it. yourself. <laughs> there are a lot of other people that can't help themselves either <laughs> <laughs> about that. Uh, so uh, what, what I would say is that for, for us, uh, full disclosure and being transparent and so you can provide, so the public can know what you're working on is really the key. It's, uh, and the, I understand the frustration that Senator Hall and Representative Middleton have, have expressed uh, about, uh, about things that they perceive constituents don't want. Um, but, you know, these local officials, uh, city councils, et cetera, et cetera. They, they were voted into office, and so I'm kind of a small government conservative about things like that. I think if those cities or those counties or those uh, school boards aren't doing what their constituents want, then their constituents need to get new members. Uh, but the real, the main thing that I want to emphasize is that, that I think the, I don't think we disagree on the need for transparency and the public being able to know what's going on. And so that's one area that I, I, I suggest that all three of us agree on wholeheartedly. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm suggesting something that's a little different than what, what, uh, what we've otherwise talked about. Did your clients or did you back or oppose the bills that provided we transparency? We we opposed we didn't weren't involved in in the, at the that was those amendments got put on at the end of the session and you know to us we are going to happily comply with whatever the legislature wants to do in terms of requiring uh, lobbyists to register to provide information uh, and that sort of thing we, we don't we're not uh, we don't have a dog in that fight we will happily comply with that that those requirements. Uh, so, any comments about that? No, no, I agree that the absolute minimum step is is got to be full transparency. Right. And and that may in itself have a have a a self correcting element to it, as people are aware. If the cities and counties will comply with what we did get passed, uh, that very well could curtail it enough that it makes it makes a significant difference when people realize how money is being used to pay for lobbyists to come down here to argue right. against things they would want. And like with the school issue, money that could be going to teachers, right. but to hire, pay our bus drivers more, or, or uh, in the city, to, uh, the cities, at small cities like where I come from, where we don't have fully staffed city, county offices because they don't have enough money, uh, just might have enough money to get that one extra person that would make a difference in elections, let's say. And, and I agree 100% on the transparency. The problem is, is we hear it privately from a lot of local elected officials. They're opposed to the ban you know, on taxpayer funded lobbying. But those same elected officials are afraid to go speak on that publicly because they know that their voters don't support that position. So, you know, I, we got to have transparency. Like the County Judges and Commissioners Association met October 9th. They unanimously voted on a number of resolutions. And all of us should ask our county judges and commissioners how they voted on that because the things that they passed was one of them. Uh, they praised legislators that voted against the property tax limits bill. Uh, another one, they voted uh, to call on us, the legislature, to raise taxes on a local option sales tax, motor fuel, severance tax, and vehicle registration fees. And they also passed a resolution to say do not pass the ban on taxpayer funded lobbying. So I expect them to be transparent in that and they're not right now legislative agenda that you just mentioned 
sounded very familiar to me as the former vice chair of revenue tax in California. <laughs> that seems a little problematic. I mean, that you're saying that these local elected officials were voting recently to advocate for basically more Those authority to tax. were passed on a voice vote. How long ago? Uh, October the 9th after session. So that's, that's something they did in the interim. a few months ago. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, um, yeah, this is, um, this is a very interesting topic. And uh, I think that it's also, um, I, th there's some complexities here. And, and by that, um, I, I mean that there are, there is a consistent thread of argument that I hear, though, from cities and counties that they represent specific communities that in the context of more conservative Texas are more progressive or more liberal, right? I mean, clearly Austin has values that might be currently, seems to have elected officials who are more in sync with San Francisco than perhaps with Plano, right? I mean, is that, so, so you know, they would argue that they should have the ability to have you know, that representation in Austin. So um, I guess that's kind of the nub of this, right? And then the question is, gee, do they have it because they can pick up the phone and call you, right? Or do they need to hire professionals to help augment that? Well, I guess I would go back to the state governments are the original elected body by the people. Ah, there you go. The state governments created the federal government. Yes. Not vice versa. And the state governments created the counties, the cities, the municipalities, right. and the school districts. And, at, and so they are not independent entities. They're not world of, among themselves. Right. Right. And we at the state level have a responsibility to the people. We're not elected by cities. We're not elected by counties. And we're not elected by school districts. We're elected by the people of Texas. Right. They're the ones who pay the taxes. They're the ones that we're put in office to protect their liberties, their rights, the free markets, et cetera. And when we see a body, whether it was elected or how it came together, whether it's a, a business that is, has um, unfair practices because of its monopoly, or communities that have people that aren't paying attention enough to their locals and what they're doing, it's our responsibility to step in and protect the people of Texas from what we consider right. to be bad actions, bad behavior by people. That's the role of government. The role of government is to protect the people, not to provide free stuff. Now, there's a group that thinks that government's supposed right. to be providing free stuff. That's not the part of the government we represent. It's to protect the people, protect their liberties and protect their rights, and we feel that that's what we'd be doing. Well, now is the time for some questions from the audience. And what I'm going to request of you is uh, we have a microphone down there somewhere. Someone's got a mic, OK? Uh, do we have a staffer who's carrying the mic? Because I, I don't see one of our TPPF people yet who's linked up with that mic, OK? Thank you. Uh, and so when I call on you, I'd like you to wait for the mic to get to you, tell us who you are, and then ask a question Please don't give us a speech. That's what we're up here for. So, so in the very back, James, there, there was a, a question. One of the very first hands I saw was in the back row there by the door. And, uh, and we'll can keep, keep going right, right over here. There. Thank you. Who are you, sir? And what's your question? Uh, Adam Kahn. I was on the RPT Legislative Priorities Committee in 2018, and I... Uh, Kind of made my, my I, I kind of made a name for myself. In question, Adam. Question. Uh, my question is for the two elected officials on the two legislators. So obviously, an outright ban on taxpayer-funded lobbying is, and a frontal assault on it is one avenue to go. Um, that being said, a couple weeks ago, I just sort of had the idea. Would it be possible to put a rider in the budget giving the state of Texas authority to claw back ah. money it gives to political subdivisions if the political subdivision uses that money to hire or uses any money to hire lobbyists? So clawback provision is it would do you think it would be constitutional would it pass constitutional muster and it would be something that could be enacted that would work? basically saying, look, if any local entity 
constituted by the state of Texas uses taxpayer money to lobby that we're going to basically take that money back from any appropriations that you might get from state government. And put it in the property tax relief fund, right? Yeah. 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 I, I, think, yeah. I think it'd certainly be worth well taking a look at. I'm not sure we could, that it might not be a bigger hill to climb to get that legal to do it. So you don't think it's a distinction, I, with, it's a distinction without a difference versus an outright ban? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I would say it'd be worth it'd be worthwhile looking into, yeah. but I think it'd probably be a bigger bigger hill to climb, and it would also set a precedent that some people might not be wanting to set uh, for doing that. But but it's certainly yeah. worth looking into. Interesting. Uh, question in the second row here. Thank you. My name is Terry Hall with Texans Uniting for Reform and Freedom, and our organization actually sued the state of Texas prior to you guys both taking office years ago for illegally using our gas tax money to hire registered lobbyists. It's already in statute that they can't do that, and they did it. And there was no recourse ever against the agency for that illegal act. So not only do I support your bills, what are we going to do when it comes time to enforce because they just ignore it. And they got away with it, and it says in statute right now today that there's supposed to be a penalty to their administrative salaries in essence. Okay, and that never happened, but to me that's not enough. If you illegally hire a lobbyist with our tax money when it clearly says they can't, there should be a penalty for that. But the other thing that TaxDOT did was they just fired the lobbyist and created a government affairs agency within, the agency, within their agency that then lobbies Staff members are lobbying the legislature, which the Texas government code also prohibits. So I just wanted you to ask the legislators, Senator Hall and, and Representative Middleton, if you have thought about expanding your bill to address some of those issues, or even if it's separate legislation, it seems like it's something we certainly need to address. I mean, the taxpayers, that was the one of the enforcement, or the enforcement mechanism in the ban was the best people to self-police the ban or the taxpayers who were being taken advantage of, right? So you get to bring a taxpayer suit, an injunction, and then your legal fees get paid, and the practice is stopped. You know, would I like more teeth? Of course. Like with the state agencies lobbying, I think it's a $100,000 fine. If they get adjudicated, it should be more than that, you know? And, and some of that goes into the rules, you know, where you see state agencies uh, testify on a bill they're not on, they're for or against, you know. So we need better enforcement of are you on or are you against because it sounds like you're either one and you're not in the middle, you know. So we really have to do a better job at that and I think that's, that's a House Senate rules thing, you know. In the front row. My name is Fran Rhodes and my question is also for the legislators. Um, how does the issue of union dues being deducted from government paychecks and passed on to unions, how does that relate to taxpayer-funded lobbyists? And I'm not sure that it does, but I always see those two things talked about together. And I, I would just like to understand that better. That one doesn't. I, you want to? It, it actually doesn't. Um, but I have discovered in my letters that I sent out to 3,000 uh, cities, counties, and school districts that it that there is a similar practice where there is a payment going from straight from the uh, taxing entity to a taxpayer-funded lobbying organization, sort of like the the union, you know, straight from governmental entity to a union for TASBO, TASA, uh, a couple of the you know obviously you can do that for TAC because that represents the whole. What are county. these acronyms? We we have Ta a, TASBO we have a room full is of people that don't Texas know those acronyms. Association of Business Administrators, TASA is Texas Association of School Administrators. So these are the employees, sort of like uh, you know the the union members and individuals, right? So it, it, it's set up kind of similar. They're not related. That that I heard that a lot, and I bet you did too in session. Is this uh, a union dues bill, and no, this is a lobbying bill, anti-lobbying, taxpayer-funded lobbying bill. So, but I, ha I never knew until recently that that was occurring where it's kind of similar uh, to union dues in some ways. But that would require separate uh, Yeah, separate, yeah. Okay, somewhere, yes, right, right back here, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for speaking about this issue. Um, I've been to the to the legislature numerous times, and uh, one time I saw a bunch of busloads of kids from middle school kids, and all in t-shirts, and ran into the little girls in the bathroom, asked them why they were there. They said they get to come for the legislative session throughout the legislative session for their field trips. And so one of them, they, I started asking a question what they're lobbying for. They're going to visit all the legislature, all the legislators, and they couldn't really s explain it without their notes, and one of them happened to throw her notes in the trash afterwards. <laughs> they were all, um, uh, you know, driven by ideology. And it's very troubling to me that, our again, our taxpaying dollars, you, you talk about, you know, this money needs to go to teachers. Well, we need to make sure that we're understanding what these teachers are doing with our kids. And then the second thing is the, I saw also uh, that you mentioned earlier the, the city uh, officials that were coming to the legislature and then testifying for the, against the uh, tax, lowering the taxes. So I went online to get a list of those that testified, and I just happened to download it. Well, several months later, when somebody was looking for it, that list disappeared offline. And so I thought that was really interesting that no one could find that list anymore. And the and the and the those people who had gone didn't tell their people and back home that they'd been there to lobby. And so my question is, why are we not doing a better job of training our citizens to become active? Because they don't, number one, that most of them don't know how to use the kiosk. And um, then when we get, when they get there, they don't know, you know, how to, f except for the postings on the wall, which hearing room they need to go to. It's, a, it's mass confusion for the new people that we need to, you know, the, the voices that are silent. And it becomes so cumbersome for them after they've driven hours to get there. And then th there was also a bill that you said about uh, doing, being able to do a, a tele, um, here, tele testifying, and that got shut down by the lobbyists because I was at that legislative session too, so the, um, that hearing. And so my question again is how can we be more proactive about not stacking the hearings, number one, with the lobbyists first, and then the second thing is, you know, a tr having a real clear, concise training method in place for citizens. <laughs> I spent about six years in the, in the Tea Party trying to do what you're talking about doing. And uh, right now I've got this, this part-time job. It doesn't give me time to go out and do that. But what, what we need is more participation by, by the public. I mean. I was reading something the other day, and it said, you know, our, our ancestors, the, the greatest generation, crossed two oceans to liberate people. And we've got people in this country today who won't even walk across the street to vote. And so you're talking about curing apathy and indifference of folks out there, and it's going to take the grassroots itself doing it. That's outside the purview of the legislature to pass a law to, to require that. Uh, it's just a matter of the grassroots paying attention. Well, and this, this, you know, banning taxpayer-funded lobbying would amplify the voice of taxpayers because right now you're getting drowned out with your own money paying for lobbyists, you know, so it's not fair. Right. So this, this would even the playing field uh, in a lot of ways where your voice is, is a lot louder because of just the volume, like in um, House Bill 281, we had like 100 uh, people come and testify for the bill from all over Texas. No one was paying them to be there. You know, they just wanted this passed. And they were pro-taxpayer champions and they wanted it done. You know, and I think that's what we're gonna see more of if we can end this practice. The, you know? the, the terrible thing though about that day for that specific bill, and Tom will remember this, is one of the bills that was heard just before your bill was the bill to allow lemonade stands in cities without being shut down by the police. You know, have a little 12 year old girl arrested by the police for an illegal lemonade stand. And so you had all these kids, these cute kids up to testify. And then you had like Tom and, and I there to, uh, we're, uh, we're here to oppose or support uh, House Bill 2 It's like, who wants to hear from these two old guys after all these cute 12 year olds were talking about how they got arrested by cops for selling <laughs> lemonade. Remember that? That's right. I mean, we, we went up for yeah. like three hours or yeah. something. It just, yeah. yeah, it was terrible. <laughs>
Never, what do they say? Never, never act with kids yeah. or, or dogs or something like yeah, that, yeah. right? Okay. Right. So we have a question over here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, earlier, a comment was made to Senator Hall about his perception of, of what might be wrong with this funded lobbying. Uh, as an advocate for annexation reform from the beginning of it in 2000 and spending all day there listening to all the testimony, testimony we finally got the right to vote in the last session. And I come to learn a lot about the Texas Municipal League, the TML, over, over the last couple of decades. And the, these are not the good guys. They've lobbied against everything, every reform that we've ever believed in. At the top of my list was annexation. They were always there. And they used taxpayer money. I want to know, that's not a perception, with all due respect. That's reality. What would you say to that, advocating up the gentleman to the left of Senator Hall? I don't know you. What would you say to that? I think he's talking to you. Left. Yes, Senator Hall. Oh, to the left. Oh. <laughs> Me? My, my Tom, Tom. Left. Oh. It's my other left. What? You're, you're, you looked at Senator Hall and said you have this perception. It's not perception. It's real. They spend our tax day or taxpayer money uh, against us. TML's been doing it my entire adult life. Well, as I've said, as I've said, I think it's very important that you be able to know what TML is lobbying about. You be able, you, it's important that you be able to know how much they're being, they're, they're paying to do it. Uh, you, our, we, the, being able to, to know and act on that knowledge is, is a better service to the public than absolutely banning something that's still gonna happen. Because you, you won't find that there will be less lobbying because you ban something, it'll just be in the dark. It's and the taxpayer funded. Right, exactly. Let them go out and earn that money the same way we do. Uh, so, I'll fill that in a little bit Sure, more. please. Um, you know, Reagan said personnel is policy, right? Who you hire reflects your policy. Uh, and TML's president uh, was a Midland City Councilman. He quit to run as a Democrat against John Cornyn. And TML's just hired a new chief lobbyist. It was Joe Strauss's former chief of staff. How many conservative bills did Joe Strauss kill? So I think we know what their policy is. So just to the gentleman that raised the question, that we didn't get your name, by the way. Okay, so Robert Roos. So, um, Robert the Bruce, wasn't that? Wow. You, you, you all been a troublemaker for a few centuries, I think, but it's uh, okay. So, um, yeah, yeah. What's in a name? You know, a rose by any other name, right? Okay, so, so part of the challenge with this, though, is that even if you were to cut off the taxpayer funded spigot to the Texas Municipal League, there are other ways that they're going to be able to do this. Kind of to Tom's point about money will always find a way. One of the things that these associations will do next, and it may require additional legislation, although you might start coming up against the First Amendment, is that they have magazines that they, that they have subscriptions. And what they'll do is they'll sell ad space at 100 times the legitimate ad rate because everybody knows, wink, wink, you know, the, you're not really buying ads to have eyeballs look at. You're buying influence for the organization, right? So different... Different contractors like your bond salesmen or your heavy equipment or people that sell cement and asphalt will buy these ads and these trade publications at an inflated rate, which will then go into paying lobbyists. All First Amendment, you know, you might argue it's, it's immoral and it's kind of using a circuitous route to get the money to what they want to spend it on, but that's what will probably happen for certain groups when, when this practice, if it's banned. So, so you, can't, you can't like think you've won and just go home. It's gonna, this is gonna be a battle for a while, probably. So we had a question up here. Yeah, first, I had a, first a quick softball. I know some of these things. I'm Warren Norred. I'm here with a number of other people who are members of the State Republican Executive Committee. Thank you. Um, I've heard some of these things, but some of what you've said today are brand new to me, and it seems like there should be an easy link somewhere that I can share with other people. Let's say here's your top 10 things you didn't know about taxpayer-funded lobbying. 
because this is dynamite stuff that I've never heard before, and I, I pay some attention. So uh, my question uh, is, if we have cities that are giving money to an organization without a contract, how does that not violate the constitutional ban on gifts? You got me. I really don't understand how that works. It, but thank you, by the way, for the Republican Party of Texas on your March 3rd primary ballot. There'll be a proposition on there, and it'll say, Texas should ban the practice of taxpayer-funded lobbying, which allows your tax dollars to be spent on lobbyists who work against the taxpayer. So I encourage all of y'all to vote yes. It is, it is hurting the taxpayer, and uh, I'm excited to see the results of that. In the primary ballot so proposition. To the question, though, about the Texas Municipal League, it's my understanding, and maybe I can be corrected if this is not, not correct, is that, is that generally speaking, city councils will vote to whether or not to pay a subscription to be a member of TML, right? And that subscription is paid with, is it paid with tax do dollars, right? So, so there, there's typically a vote, I think, Right, and some cities are not members of TML. Right, they they think that they can do better on their own. For example, they they may hire a staffer whose job it is to basically be the liaison with the state government, uh, and so um, so so it's done differently. Right, and and my my other understanding with TML is that they generally have some sort of a consensus mechanism, where like if one city doesn't like the policy. That that city's kind of on its own, right? Because if the majority of cities say no, this is what we want to do, right? Is that about how it works with TML? So. Yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a they it's a um, I don't know. Yeah, no. it's it's kind of its own environment, right? It's its own uh, ecosystem of of. Uh, uh, I think there I think there's a vote, right? Because you have to allocate money. Well, it, they're, they're getting a service for it, right? So it's like when they, they build a road. Uh, we, probably have, we probably have time for a couple more questions. In the very back corner, I think I saw a hand, right? Did the hand come down? Was someone stretching? Okay, then, then uh, sorry, James, to make you run around. You'll come back. Uh, and again, your name and a question, please. Thank you. Hi, my name's Angela Smith. I'm from Fredericksburg, Texas. I just wanted to um, state that I appreciated what uh, Senator Hall said, that it's our right as individuals to petition, not um, governments. So we can talk about all these hypotheticals that might happen if, in fact, we ban this. Why don't we just ban it and see what happens? That's I mean, what we tried to do. Yeah, yeah, well, let's, let's, <laughs> let's do it. That. I'm just it, saying, I think everybody in this room it, would it, totally it, agree. Let's it, ban it, and when it, they pop, when corruption always stays corrupt, right? They're, right. they're inherently corrupt. They'll mm -hmm. pop up somewhere else. We'll take care of them when that happens. Yeah, we're fine. No, that's, well, that's exactly what I expect to happen. We're, I fully expect this will be uh, high on the list for next session. What I'm hearing out of our Lieutenant Governor uh, is it's, it hasn't fallen off the top of his priority list. It's, as he's uh, pointed out, it's at the top of the Republican Party list, so I expect it will be there. But part of the conundrum we have here in this free society that we try to legislate around is always being sensitive to individual liberty and the guarantees of the Constitution, which is set up so that we can't fix everything with government by passing a law. We're going to have this going and it's in since the Supreme Courts have taken the position of money being part of free speech we've got that and you couple that with the fact that the heart of man is basically evil they're always going to find or you know the when we have signy day die you know what immediately goes into action are hundreds of thousands of attorneys around combing through the legislation to see how we can how they can circumvent all of what just got passed and so you got to come back and fix it. And that's never going to change. And if we ever tried to fix that, you wouldn't like the society we had, would have. And so we will have to live. We might shut it down one way, but it, it's like the whack-a-mole. We'll sit it back down one place and it'll pop up in another. And we'll just have to address that when it comes up. Sounds but we like, can't ignore it. Sounds like the people Tom represents have, uh, have something in the way of job security. Uh, we have one more. Question down here, sir, your name and your question. Yeah, howdy, my name's Dan Davis. I'm actually a locally elected official for the city of Manville. We're about 30 minutes south of Houston, Texas. 
So I think the key word that's been discussed here is taxpayer-funded lobbying. There's a lot of ways that cities get money that's not through the taxpayer. You have impact fees, plan review fees, permit fees. I've seen cities that with the facade, ordinate, or the facade law that was passed, a way that they circumvent that is they set, instead incentivize the developer and they bump up their permit fee costs and they say instead, if you design your facade a certain way, we'll reduce your permit fees. Well, that's not taxpayer funded money. That's coming from the developer, that's coming from businesses, that's coming from impact fees. So how do you propose addressing that where cities will circumvent the legislation to it bump up the price in other areas to funnel that money through because it's not taxpayer well, let me money. do a prep. So to the lawmakers, this was anticipated, right? So there were different, there was different language and different bills that perhaps the senator or the representative might want to talk about that anticipated exactly that, that instead of taxpayer, it was like public funds public or something. Public yeah. Public yeah. Funds. yeah, because no. with all due respect, our, our approach is if an entity is getting, if a, an elected body is getting money from the people, whether it's fees, uh, whether it's assessments, or what they want to code name it, it is taxpayer funded. It is people funded. It's the same thing. And so the, the issue, what, what, what tag you put on it, because there is no income to, to, you know, unless a city owns a hotel. That would be the closest thing you would say to money coming in from that would not necessarily be taxpayer funded. But, but if uh, the, the builder fees, those will get passed on to the people that occupy the building. It gets passed on to the people in there. So the, the intent, and I think we had word in there, was public funds. And that means what, any, what the city, county, school district, money, whatever they get, would, would be included. And that could not be used. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Uh, I, I want to point out or, or to note that in this last legislative session, and I've been a part of many, both with the foundation and in my prior life uh, in a state that won't be mentioned, I saw more citizen activism this last session than I've ever seen in my career in public service. And so I want to congratulate many of you who made that happen. Uh, keep it up. It's noticed. And please uh, give a round of applause to Representative Middleton, Senator Hall, and Tom Forbes for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.